for you. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, I want first to acknowledge my presence and that of UCLA and the Department of Information Studies on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva people. So today, um, I wanted to, since this is a doctoral colloquium, I thought it would be um, maybe interesting to you if I focused, first of all, provided a bit of background on this initiative, which is a huge initiative with a number of different projects, but then to focus on motivating questions, research design, um, data sources, and animating concepts for the Refugee Rights in Records project, which is the founding project for this conglomeration of projects. And I wasn't going to talk about the Refugee Rights and Records framework that we've developed, um, unless we've time, and I'm happy to do it if we do have time. And also, I have a whole set of um, areas that we've identified for further work that we could talk about. But again, um, we might find that that just takes too long today. So, sorry, I'm having trouble moving ahead here. Okay, so the Refugee Rights in Records or R3 initiative um, is, uh, was as uh, Jeru says, was um, founded by myself and Dr. James Lowry, um, who was at the Liverpool University Center for Archive Studies and is now at Queens College, City University of New York, Graduate School of Library and Information Studies. Um, this is um, an international multidisciplinary, multi-stakeholder research collaboration. Um, we started work on this um, in the middle of, um, I think that when public attention really came to, came to the massive um, refugee and migrant crises that were happening around the world in 2016, and we've been working on it since then. The we here are academics, archives and library professionals and their institutions, grassroots organizers and their organizations, and also artists and other people from various other backgrounds um, who've been collaborating on a cluster of different projects. Um, and we're working primarily in spaces where refugees have fled or have settled or where they're crossing borders at the moment. And I'm going to use the term refugees throughout, although refugees has a specific legal meaning, but we are um, talking about people who are stateless, people who are internally displaced, um, people who are seeking asylum, um, and sometimes um, people who are described um, by governments and press as migrants, um, economic migrants, um, but we're um, interested in people basically who've been forcibly displaced by conflict, by oppression um, and suppression, um, by climate change, by poverty, um, and various other reasons why, why people are forced to leave their homes and their homelands. So the, the starting point for this research is a conversation that's been going on for quite a while in the archival field about the role that people in this field could be, should be playing in societal grand challenges. Um, it is our belief that in many of the biggest, and we have data to show this, the biggest and most complex challenges that face mankind today, records, archives, and record keeping, which is the term of art um, that has been developed to address all aspects of creating, managing, using, disseminating records and all of the agents and transactions who are involved in that, that, that these um, aspects play a central role as part of the challenge. They are actually part of the problem, the knotty problem that creates grand challenges, but they also offer parts of the solution. So that's the sort of standpoint that we come from. There are over 80 million forcibly displaced people in the world today, and that's according to the latest statistics from the United Nations. Of those, 
30 to 35 million are children and at least 4.2 million are stateless, many of them who've been stateless now for many generations, uh, beginning with the Palestinians um, and coming forward from then. 281 million people also live outside their country of origin. And this speaks also to economic migrants who might not fall within UN High Commission for Refugee Statistics. The creation, preservation and accessibility of bureaucratic as well as personal and community records and other kinds of documentation. And here we take a very wide view of what are considered to be records we believe are fundamental to these individuals and communities ability to exercise their human rights and to thrive and to thrive today and to thrive tomorrow and to their grandchildren to thrive in the future. This has always been the case, I think. Certainly it's been the case since the beginning of the 20th century when we first started seeing passports to enable the ability to move from, from one nation state to another. But something very distinctive has changed and it has changed. I started work many years ago looking at what happened with the wars in Yugoslavia and the countries that emerged out of there. And those wars, um, particularly in Croatia and Bosnia, ended around 1995, which is exactly the moment when the internet started really to take over and electronic communications, popular electronic communications. And what we're seeing today is that new technological implementations and, and these are everything from um, using the cloud to blockchain to social media to drones um, to infrared sensing, as well as um, various what we're calling bio based data collection, which includes biometrics and also includes DNA. These have really been game changers and they all revolve around issues then of record keeping. So first of all, just to say a little bit about um, who we all are and where we are, this map gives you an idea of where the different projects, um, people who are working on the different projects are based. And I'm just going to say a little bit about each of them before I come back to the Rights and Records project. So the R archive is an archive that's been developed by a group called the Rohingya Project. This is a grassroots initiative um, for um, stateless um, Rohingya population is distributed around the world. Um, many of them are in um, Saudi Arabia, um, in Pakistan, in Malaysia, and um, James Lowry and I are working with them to develop um, a prototype um, blockchain um, based archive to hold documents that will um, substantiate um, Rohingya presence in what was Burma, also known as Myanmar, um, and allow the Rohingya people to transmit these documents and admit them also into legal, um, legal uh, proceedings. Um, the, this, this work was recognized by the Roddenberry Foundation. They provided funding through the Catalyst Prize um, in January, which is a prize that's awarded to early stage innovative ideas with the potential for disruptive change. Um, a second project is one I think that you've already heard about, the Amplification Project, which was initiated by my colleague, Dr. Cathy Carboni here at UCLA, um, which is um, a project to develop um, a platform that um, provides an, um, a, a space and a preservation space for new and existing artistic and activist productions that relate to forced migration and it obviously has many other things that it is, is doing as well. Um, and I think Cathy's here, and if you want to know more about it, um, it's something that uh, I'm sure she'd be happy to talk about. Um, a project you might not have heard about um, is a project that's ongoing at the moment in Guam. Uh, Guam, of course, is a US, um, I want to say it's a US territory, it might be a US protectorate. 
This is a project that is led by Dr. Melissa Titano at the University of Guam. And Melissa is a graduate also of our doctoral program. It's called Wait For Me. And um, there, it is a project that's working with um, a fairly large number of LGBTQ plus Russian refugees who are, have been stuck in Guam now for, since 2015, awaiting US State Department decision about what's to happen to them. They've been fleeing persecution and um, imprisonment and um, incarceration in mental hospitals in Russia. Um, they have their, their full families, they've got children with them. Um, and this project is using still and portrait photography, oral history and videography to bring attention to their plight. It is um, being sponsored by PBS and it will be produced. Um, this work will be um, curated into a documentary that should be finished by the end of the summer. And it's also being funded by the Office of the Lieutenant Governor of Guam. This is a, a project, this is not the project, this is a plight that Guam really wants to draw attention to. Um, curating archives, curating slippages is led by Mariana Hofhanissian, who is a doctoral student in, or uh, well, she's an art curator and doctoral student at UCSD. Um, this is funded by the University of California Critical Refugee Studies Collective. And this is um, a historical project that is looking at documentation that has survived, particularly in California, um, that um, was brought to the US or is about um, are the survivors of the 1915 Armenian genocide. So a lot of this work's been done in Fresno and obviously in Glendale. And it's looking at where personal and community materials are located and attempting not just to um, find a way to collate them intellectually, to, to bring them together, but also to look at the various ways for the material, not a lot of it's in personal hands, um, but that material that is in public libraries and um, research units throughout California, a lot of it has been um, very much um, misclassified, mistagged. Um, it, the, a lot of the description is full of all sorts of presumptions that actually aren't correct. And so this is a project to look at this and find alternative ways to describe these materials and surface hidden narratives. Um, another set of work that's ongoing is in Queensland and it's led by Eli Syed Abdi. And she is working in public libraries with um, information literacy um, for recently arrived um, Australia has taken in over the years a lot of refugees um, at different points um, and, and she's developed what's called, she is called a migrant information literacy framework, um, but this is really um, to help information professionals to um, help in turn immigrants who've got particular skills, recent um, immigrants to integrate into Australian society and also um, uh, to provide a tool that they hope will also work with immigration service um, officers too. So all of that brings us to the Refugee Rights in Records project, which is, as I said, it was the first project that we started. It's the project that is still ongoing and it's the project that has taken us around the world. Um, and we've not been able to go around the world for the last 15 months um, to do some of the work that, that needs to be done. Um, but um, this is the project that centers around records and the data that they contain and the various kinds of um, mandates and systems and processes that are tied up with records. So the precipitating questions for this project, um, first of all, um, to go back to the statement I made earlier about the fact that um, technology has really changed um, the dynamics around people who are forced to move and, and how that happens and how they become accepted into other spaces. 
there is a parallel dynamic to that as well, which is that the legal production requirements for documents have also changed and become incredibly complex and diverse. Um, at the US southern border, under the last administration, lawyers who were working as um, asylum um, ad advocates for asylum seekers were saying that in fact, weekly, um, the US government was changing the rules on which documents had to be produced, in what form, um, with what kind of tests applied to them. And it's so we wanted to see if indeed we could substantiate that documentation is being used as a weapon by states, um, both, both, both states who are displacing people, which often involves withholding their records or, or destroying their records or taking their records away from them so they can never come back, which is one of the issues we've been looking at both with the Rohingya, but also in the Armenian context, but equally then states who are encountering people who've been displaced, people whose countries um, displaced people cross to get, for example, from Syria to the European Union up the Balkan route um, or um, through Central America and Mexico into the United States, but also countries that will end up being the people who accept um, these individuals um, get, provide them with asylum or become the final resettlement spaces. And if this is the case, that documentation is being used um, as a weapon, um, in fact, as a proxy for, for physical force against these individuals, um, might a rights and records approach provide a mechanism for countering it, perhaps not completely countering it, probably not completely countering it, but at least being that piece of the Gordian knot that, that our kinds of expertise can address. So we are operating under several grounding concepts that are drawn from recent archival theoretical development, um, plus some that have emerged out of our own research. First of all, archival sovereignty. Um, this is a concept that um, it has a lot of, uh, has drawn a lot from data sovereignty ideas, um, from various statements of indigenous principles like the First Nations principles of OCAP in, in Canada, the care, the in, um, international care principles of indigenous data governance. But what it says is that it's the principle that every human being, regardless of their circumstances and background, should be able to exercise some control over records and record keeping systems and environments that relate to or impact themselves. A second concept is, is quite similar to that, archival autonomy. Um, but if one is about having certain um, forms of um, input into records that somebody else keeps about you, archival autonomy is about your own ability um, to, um, to, to create records, to be participatory agents in record keeping and archiving. So it's the ability for individuals and communities to participate in societal memory with their own voice and to become participatory agents in record keeping and archiving for identity, memory and accountability purposes. And this is drawn from work um, by our colleagues at Monash University in Australia. And there's a citation there to Evans et al from 2015. Archival agency, we argue, is the ethic that compels archivists and other record keepers to use their expertise and positions to advocate and exercise care for the humans who are subject to, captured in and affected by archives, records and record keeping systems with which they work. And then the principle of human and humanitarian centered record keeping is an extension of ideas about co-creation of records and also about victim centered archives that have been put forward in my work, in some Australian work, um, in the work also of uh, Dr. Caswell, um, that prioritize conditions of precarity, inequity, injustice, and interdependency. 
some additional concepts that we have found to be relevant um, have been taken from other work. Um, radical archival agency is an idea that I developed based on the work of a um, political scientist called Heather Johnson in Northern Ireland, who has argued that um, argued for the notion of radical political agency that is exerted not out only out of desperation, but also as a choice. And we've thought about this in the context of refugees and the kinds of agency and people who have so little agency, but the kinds of agency nevertheless they exert, for example, by refusing to participate in the creation of a record or by making irregular use of records, um, which is sort of code for using documents in ways that you're not supposed to use documents or using irregular records, which is really code for saying you're working with a record that's been altered in some way. Um, we know that without doing that, often it's impossible for people to get across borders. Um, but today with digital technology and digital documents, it, it's almost impossible to, to make these kinds of irregular uses as well. Negative evidence is a concept that we've borrowed from archeologist Severin Fowles. Um, the notion that voids actually are evidence in themselves. And we've been particularly looking at the evidentiary import of archival voids, i.e. missing documentation that relates to genocide and displacement. In this case, we've been looking at it with reference to the Armenian genocide and massive displacement that took place 19, the end of the 19, 1915 onwards. And then archival imaginaries and impossible archival imaginaries, I think a fairly familiar idea now to um, many of you who are listening today, but these are the affective counterbalances um, that are really resistant to other notions of evidence, but they tend to occur when people have, they're faced with absence of documentation um, and they, they um, may often be what they wish had happened or what they wish is the reality, um, but not something that they can make happen. But they do have, the, the idea of imaginaries is that they do have tremendous capacity to motivate, to inspire, to anger, to traumatize. And because they're invisible, because they're imaginary doesn't make them less powerful as a motivator or as a source of affect. So I think that a very important question to, is to ask is why rights in records and human rights discourses, for example, have been criticized as being Western ideas, as being ideas that um, tend to benefit people who are more powerful rather than people who are less powerful. But at the same time, we have a history um, and of um, having particular kinds of rights in records. Um, we have rights in our own medical records. We have rights in student records, or at least we hope we do, because it turns out not everybody does. Um, and we also have been working in a world where people have been talking about data rights. They've been talking about information rights. Um, and there has been um, quite a bit of work done in the archival world about the notion of rights and records, always working with the least empowered populations. So we, you know, we would always prefer that these issues were approached through an ethics of care and that that is what sets the standard for behavior and practices. But as the quote I put in here from um, a paper that Kathy and I and our Australian colleagues co-authored for the I conference recently. In governmental and institution settings, an exclusive ethics of care approach fails to address pressing issues relating to agency and accountability and cannot enforce better behavior by bad actors or deal with those who simply do not care. And the 
contexts that we're working in are with some of the most recalcitrant, intransigent um, authorities that you can possibly work with, um, wicked in many cases. Official and professional acceptance or ratification of rights frameworks support the development of legislation, standards and best practices and associated behavioral norms that do add pressure on reluctant or recalcitrant governments, as well as archival and other kinds of record keeping institutions to comply. And I think we've only to look at the impact of GDPR, um, the European um, Data Protection um, Regulation, not only on European countries, but all over the world um, to realize that one, one um, one instrument can actually force compliance because it, it does things like it forces economic structures. Um, and so it, it is the hammer um, if you can't work with the, you know, with the velvet glove or whatever. So uh, as an example, I just mentioned here, um, this is a recent paper that was published in the International Journal of Human Rights. And it was actually a response paper to a paper that Kathy and I published in the International Journal on Human Rights on rights and records for refugees. And this is um, written by um, a federation of um, scholars and also um, advocates and, and people who are, are former victims of out of home care in Australia. In Australia. Um, Frank Golding, who's the lead author, um, is himself someone who um, was a, a child in care um, and who, when he grew up, um, began to, um, uh, to advocate for children in care who have been abused and subject to um, all sorts of removals of rights. And this is what they say. A rights-based approach to record keeping and archiving complemented by an ethics of care is essential where there are demonstrably uncompliant power hierarchies that disenfranchise individuals and alienates them from their rights. Investigation of human rights violations usually exposes record keeping issues at their core and it's vital that individuals whose lives are most affected have mandated avenues to become active participatory agents in record keeping and archives. So the research design that we're working with um, is multi-method. Um, it has many different data inputs and it has been iteratively developed and uh, there are several here on this list. Um, I'm not going to talk about some of them. I'm going to talk about the, the three in the middle that are uh, bulleted um, and the final one, meta comparison. Um, but uh, we, we haven't been able at the moment to continue with our ethnographic work because of the, um, the pandemic requirements. Um, and that it has also limited our ability to do historical case studies and work in archives. But I'm going to talk about the warrant analysis component here. So I first wanted just to draw your attention to this is a very good report that was written by Emma Cummings, who was a student at the University of Liverpool on um, uh, digital, <laughs> she called it digital development technology, the technology development in support of refugee needs. Um, but in fact, it covers both how states and um, the corporate world have come together to develop technologies that are um, both monitoring technologies, but also technically aid support technologies. Um, they, they are, it's, it, it's also in many ways allowed them to experiment on people with technology developments that will then be brought into um, more, into broader public use. Um, but it's also about the uses that refugees themselves are making of digital technology to push back against um, these other technology developments. So it's an interesting report. Um, I have a link in my slides um, if anybody wants to read it or I can send the link. Um, so one of the 
big activities that we did was we undertook um, a set of events in different places around the world. Some of them we were invited to, some of them we asked, our asked ourselves. Um, we started with an initial host uh, symposium that was hosted by the Vera and Donald Blinken Open Society Archives in Budapest. And um, in case you're wondering, uh, Vera and Donald Blinken were the parents of the new Secretary of State, I think, um, Blinken. Um, and that's in Hungary. And this was followed by events and um, different kinds of events in London, in Zagreb, in Yaoundé, in Cameroon, um, in Dublin, Malmo in Sweden, Melbourne in Australia, and Los Angeles. And these events brought together a whole variety of people who one way or another are engaged with trying to address um, these issues. Um, current and former refugees, participants from the UN High Commission for Refugees, uh, the International Red Cross um, and tracing agencies, international and local NGOs who are working with refugees. Um, sometimes they're very local NGOs and sometimes they're, they're very large and well-known. Um, watchdog agencies engaged in documenting human rights abuses, witnessing organizations, lawyers, artists, and also archives and academic institutions. So historians, archivists, librarians, sometimes as well. Uh, anthropologists as well. So I just wanted to take a moment and I wanted to, um, I, uh, I wanted to acknowledge the people who were, who were hosts and co-sponsors here. Um, they, we, several of them are universities, but some of them are archives and some of them are grassroots organizations. But I will say that putting on these events sometimes was quite a safety risk to some of these organizations and also um, to, to some of the attendees as well. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. So many, we, we have a ton of data that comes out of these symposia. Um, and I just put here, sorry, this is a lot of text on this page, but oh, examples of the kinds of questions that came up. I mean, I think when we first started to talk to people about records, they went records, records. I don't, I don't know anything about records. And then the moment we started to talk, of course, everybody had, had something to say about records or documents. And just, I just highlighted a few here that I think are particularly relevant to our conversation. So what are the conditions set by different authorities for the creation, production, validation of those documents? And this is something we're dealing with, with, with the ARC, our archive, um, with the Rohingya project. Um, how do you, if different countries have set different requirements um, or requirements change from moment to moment? Um, what difficulties do refugees, especially women and children, experience? And what assistance is available to help them with identifying, understanding, obtaining, and producing records? And I'm going to come back to this theme again later because it shows up in all our data inputs. So at the US border, for example, children, even newborn babies, must represent themselves in asylum hearings, must produce their own documents. The government does not provide them with a lawyer. The government does not provide them with any kind of an advocate. Um, women, um, something we learned from when we were working here in California, um, a lot of women, um, first of all, they don't, they don't speak the language. Um, they may not speak a written language, especially indigenous women who speak other um, Central American languages. And many women, the reason I'm focusing on women here is that many women are not literate as well. And so, for example, in San Diego, there's a grassroots organization that is literally um, teaching women with documents to read documents and understand what they mean and understand what it means when they sign them. Um, I've already mentioned um, bio-based records, um, but what kind of digital and other new kinds of records are being created by whom and where? The, we, the, there's a big complex of records at work here. 
How are they being validated, used and kept? How will they be used in the future and by whom? And then how might digital technologies be employed to help refugees to duplicate, carry or access reliable copies of records about themselves? Um, the, the rules, you know, are set by the authorities. They're not set by any of us. So if you show up at a border and you've got a mobile phone um, and authorities will say, well, we need to see, like the Americans need at least 16 pieces of doc 16 documents um, and uh, the Swedes won't accept anything that isn't the original document, which is incredibly difficult for people. But you may have images of your birth certificate or your marriage certificate or your high school record or your property deed on your phone, but it's not acceptable in legal processes. On the other hand, anything else you have on your phone, like your email, your social media feed, um, photographs that you took on your trip, your mi migratory trip, um, that's not the right word, your displacement are all fair game to be used against you as evidence. So the rules about evidence are all rigged um, for the benefit of the people who are adjudicating whether or not to let you come into their country, into their space. So here's a quote from somebody who came to one of these symposium, this symposia, this was um, somebody who was um, from an African state resettled um, in Europe. And he talked about how the asylum process irreparably changed his identity. It decided for him what his identity had been before and what it would be for the future. So in his case, he came from one particular ethnic group and it turned out that the country that was taking in refugees at that time um, only were taking people from another ethnic group. So they wrote down that he came from the other ethnic group and they thought they were actually doing him a favor. He said that authorities didn't care what he said or indeed felt was that prior identity or how he might feel about the new identity they were granting to him by means of this process. The documents that were presented in support of his case by um, refugee authorities um, and for better or worse, the documents that they issued to him. And what he said was, no one tells asylum seekers about this. There's no notice over the door as there is at the security barrier in an airport that tells you that this process is a point of no return, identity-wise, at least. So he said, there's no way back to my original identity. These symposia also um, raised um, government and NGO records issues. And I know we said we were focused on the refugees, but when there are problems with government records and NGOs, there are problems caused then for the refugees. So massive incompatibility of databases and classification schemes. And this has been one of the big problems at the US southern border now in trying to um, reunite hundreds of children who are still in detention centers at the southern border with their parents because the the databases that were created were first of all very poorly created and they also didn't map into other government databases and it has been really really difficult to figure out who's who and where they were sent because these children were sent all over the place. Um, they, there is a need to map databases to eliminate the need to check multiple different databases and multiple times to make the processes quicker and to reduce the chances of error, uh, error creeping in and then becoming reified or proliferated through databases. Um, but at the same time, the wish is not to make it easier for anyone to hack into or surveil um, a, a single system. Uh, information may be, held by may be withheld by government agencies in some countries, not only from refugees, but also from other agencies of the same government, including in this country. Um, and, of, and also, of course, they're withholding 
um, information from government agencies in other countries. And sometimes, you know, proxy historical fights are uh, played out through these processes between countries. So I'll talk about it in a second, but between Turkey and Greece is an example of that. And then, of course, there are also just failed and dysfunctional bureaucracies in home countries because of conflict, um, because the civil service is in disarray, because of poverty, and because often what we found in the case of um, many of the uh, refugees who'd come from African states, that there were never these records created in the first place. And when they cross the Mediterranean, they move into a whole world that assumes those records exist when they don't exist. Okay, so at the same time that there's a lot of ineptitude, recalcitrance, um, dysfunctionality in government um, record keeping, um, there's also a whole lot of um, modern implementations that are really quite scary. So there's widespread creation and sharing by governments of biometric and genetic, as well as security information on refugees with local and with international police like Interpol and with intelligence agencies that, that you know, are part of, you know, you're chummy with. Um, without any consideration of the future implications for refugees and their relatives, and indeed their descendants, when you start sharing genetic materials. Um, one of the quotes that somebody said in one of these symposia was that digital footprints can travel faster than indiv individuals themselves and predetermine their reception upon arrival. And another statement we heard was that records are hugely important for tracking migratory paths and putting services in place when they arrive, meaning refugees. But the kinds of sensitive records that are created in Ireland are not like those that are kept on any other people in Ireland. So it's also a scary statement. So NGOs, um, that one of the things um, that they complained about was that they had very little data on long-term outcomes of refugee experience, um, people who pass through their programs. And this includes UNHCR. Um, so there's a need here for more, um, more data about you know, what happens to people after they've moved through that immediate crisis experience. They need more and more trusted data on outcomes um, that um, would help them perhaps in pushing back against the kinds of hate speech that is being proliferated against refugees by governments, political parties, social media voices. Um, they also are working under dire conditions, NGOs. I mean, they're often working out of tents and keeping records isn't their primary mission and paying to keep records would take money away from what they're supposed to be doing. So what, who can do that kind of record keeping and archiving for them and at what points? And there are some archivists, some of the UNHCR archivists are out there literally working in tents on, on these, um, in these sort of migrant spaces at the moment. Um, aid agencies also need secure places to store records and they keep copies sometimes for the refugees of their records so that they can provide them back to them if they lose their original documents. But they don't trust archivists. Um, they don't think that they're trustworthy and they don't think that they're competent as well. In fact, they don't trust anybody. Um, they have rough lives themselves. Um, they also need to um, keep their own bureaucratic records. This is very important, um, not only for their own self-knowledge, but to continue to stay funded and also for organizational transparency and accountability, because they have to be trusted to work in the spaces that they're working in. And I just wanted to mention, this is a, a piece that was in Al Jazeera this morning um, or last night about um, uh, interactions going on at the moment between Turkey and Greece and, and where Greece is accusing NGOs of being refugee smugglers. And Greece has brought in um, a new law that is obliging aid groups to undergo professional audits, um, which requires them to have really good record keeping in place. Uh, we also, another data input um, that we um, 
we had was that um, we conducted extensive analyses between 2016 and 2019 of both policy reports and media reports that were coming out in English and coming out also in Arabic. And um, Sakina Alalawi, who is um, one of our doctoral students, um, did a lot of this work, particularly with the Arabic media and um, produced um, the reports that are listed here. Um, Christelle Jimenez, who was a master's student also um, looked at um, parallel issues, um, particularly affecting Arabic refugees, but not just, or Syri I'm sorry, Syrian refugees in Turkey, but not just Syrian refugees, um, and uh, also produced a report, which has now been published in the uh, PD and C journal, I think it's called BTD and C. Um, and again, we have a long list of findings about records, and I know that we're short on time. Um, so I, I'm not gonna go through these, but we can go back to them if you're interested. I did want to highlight some in particular. I said I would come back to this issue of women and children. Um, there are so many issues uh, about women and children and women and children are still predominantly the largest number of people um, who, are, who are moving in these refugee flows. Um, we, we, and a lot of these are cultural issues. So you have to have a textually recorded marriage certificate or contract, but um, many marriages are con conducted as oral contracts. Um, and also often, even if they were recorded as written contracts in many countries, a wife has no right to get a, con a copy of her own, of her own marriage certificate. Um, when you uh, start also dealing with, um, uh, with uh, um, populations where polygamous marriage is common or where what in the West is considered to be underage and in, in the home countries considered to be child marriage occurs, those women have absolutely no rights if they try to move into the West and they can be separated from their children um, the fathers can take the children too. Um, and when you are looking for birth certificates, they instead have family records and, and children have to be registered by the fathers. Mothers can't register children. So uh, a pregnant mother who gives birth um, when she is displaced and there is no father there cannot register the birth of her own child. Marriages and births often require traveling back to the home country to register. Um, this is what happened with the case in, in Turkey um, uh, of, um, now I'm completely, I'm completely blanking on his name, um, the, the Saudi um, journalist who was murdered in the embassy in Turkey. He was trying to um, get the documents to remarry and had to certify that he, he was no longer married to his previous wife because Turkey does not um, uh, permit polygamy. Um, so there are many issues of gender bias um, and issues of, that have um, not just gender bias, but gender discrimination. Um, but a lot of this is contributed then to women not being able to flee, um, women not being able to be reunited in a polygamous family women being separated from their children or not being able to prove that children are their children. And because we have a very large um, flow of refugees coming out of particularly Syria at the moment, these are really big um, considerations. But it has been a consideration for Middle Eastern refugees um, for the last 60 or 70 years now. Um, and uh, a couple of statements from those reports, it must be noted that such recommendations which we've made um, for creating, maintaining and accessing textual records are themselves, which we see as solutions, but they are imbued with Western notions regarding how families are structured and marriages legitimated and leave little room for the beliefs and values that underlie many polygamous marriages. Um, and it puts um, people who are caught in that bind in a in terribly, terribly difficult situation that has to do with really um, incommensurate belief and value systems. And 
as long as they remain unresolved, these records concerns have a multiplier effect on, on their critical humanitarian consequences, as well as on the immediate interim and longer term economic, social and other costs to the individual nations and, and society um, that are hosting these individuals. And this is without a doubt the case of, of multiple generations of stateless Palestinians. So the third input, um, and I haven't got lots of um, other slides that relate to this, but the third input was a, a very close reading that we did of all sorts of juridical in, uh, instruments that have bearing on um, what we're concerned about with records. And there's just a list of them here. And we also looked at, at rights statements that were being made by people who were interested in data rights and information rights. But let me, in the interest of moving on um, quickly, just say that the conclusions from all of these inputs, and, and I haven't gone through every input that we had, um, first of all, is that um, what somebody considers to be documentation really depends on the background, the context, the intent and the receptiveness of the parties involved. Um, the US National Archives used to say a record is whatever we say it is. And, and that's a lot of what's going on here. So we have to think about um, data. We have to think about records. But we also have to think about testimony and stories and sometimes artifacts, sometimes scars on bodies. I mean, there are many things that we have to think about as a record. Um, Records and record keeping our data shows are indeed weaponized and new technology implementations have contributed to this. But at the same time, records and record keeping systems and entities like archives are often ineffective, disabled, antiquated, and just unaware as well. And that is true in home countries and in host countries. So any strategy to address these conclusions has to take several things into account. There are widely disparate power relations going on. Um, we have to put a human face on these numbers. The, these numbers um, that are broadcast about refugees and migrants, and I don't like to use that term because it is used in a very derogatory way. They are widely used for political purposes on, on every side but they're also used to dehumanize. When you hear those numbers, you don't see the human face. We need to promote a plural view of what is a record. Um, that, that we need to be able to come up with a strategy that has local implementation capacity, but can also work across jurisdictions. And it has to scale massively. We're talking about an enormous set of problems, an enormous number of circumstances and human beings. So well, let's see if I can get to there. Um, out of all of this is how we have been developing our rights in records framework. Um, it has been based on a very close reading of each data source um, to see whether there are explicit or implicit records or record keeping implications. And then thinking about whether from that you could abstract to a potential right in or to records. We then compiled these rights into a single framework um, and we kept with them an indication of the warrant that we used um, to generate that right and any um, counter arguments we had also encountered at the same time. And we juxtaposed these with three other frameworks um, that have been proposed by communities with overlapping interests. Um, coming the Swiss Peace uh, Conceptual Framework for Dealing with the Past, the HHI's um, Signal Code and the Toronto Declaration Protecting the Right to Equality and Non-Discrimination in Machine Learning Systems that Amnesty International and Access Now have promulgated. We then published this preliminary framework in the International Journal for Human Rights and made a public call for feedback and based on feedback that we got, we further revised the framework. Um, we then did a meta comparison of the framework with the framework that was developed in that Australian rights in childhood record keeping in out of home care research project and um, the, the care leavers um, 
advocacy network, I think it is the clan um, network framework also for rights and records for, to do with children um, in care. And we made further revisions. Um, we held focus groups of concerned archivists and academics and activists, this is most recently, and did further revisions. We've come up with a framework now that we feel is no longer specific to refugees, that is much more applicable in, in contexts, all those kinds of contexts that I mentioned where there is precarity, where there is vulnerability, where there is massive power inequity. Um, the Australians like to talk about this as universal. Anytime somebody says something's universal makes me very nervous and uncomfortable. Um, but it's definitely something that has moved beyond just the, just is not the right word, but the situations of individual refugees. So I'm just going to very quickly say what we did with the meta comparison and I'll just leave it at that. Um, so this is, a, this is a graph developed by, for the Rights and Records by, by Design project in Australia, which is another big cluster of projects um, that has been working along a sort of parallel um, parallel momentum to us. And in fact, there are parallel projects that have gone on in Canada, in England, in Australia, in Ireland, in other countries where um, children have been removed from indigenous communities, children have been transported from one country to another, um, or, or children have been removed from their families for other reasons and put in these care situations. Um, we did a little um, mapping of our projects into the same kind of idea and came up with something that was quite parallel. Um, but I just wanted to say, for, because this is a research colloquium, um, the value that we found in meta comparison. So here are two very big projects that have been long-term projects with multiple um, facets to them. But by um, looking at the frameworks um, that they developed and that we developed, we were able to identify what was in common between um, what we had each come to in different ways with different warrants. What we found was that where there was divergence, it was usually specific to the particular context in which they were devised, um, uh, um, out of home care or um, refugee contexts. And what that sort of suggested to us that those are the sorts of things that probably should be specified specifically relating to those issues, but rather, rather than being something that was more universally applicable and likely would be addressed through national local sector laws and regulations. We also found that children, that children are the most vulnerable populations in both cases. And they were an intersecting priority. Um, uh, indigenous children in particular was an intersecting priority, but children in general. And of course, when we put children in detention here in the United States who are considered to be migrant children, their circumstances um, start to then intersect a lot with the work that's been go going on in Australia. But this kind of cross analysis emphasizes how important it is to bring together parallel research projects. We didn't work together along the way, we came together afterwards. Um, and that by using different methods and applying these in different contexts, we still obtained similar results, um, which has helped us to do some triangulation and to validate the research outcomes. Um, and the final thing I would say, um, uh, I'm not gonna get to, you know, further work that we're going to do and needs to be done. But we did together um, in uh, respond, we were invited to su submit a general comment to the United Nations Committee on the rights of the child. They're re-looking at the digital rights of the child. And these usually are thought about more in terms of literacy and uh, access to information technology and, and um, access to reading, uh, uh, what people that sort of the kinds of services that public libraries, for example, could provide. They had never thought about children and records before. So we were asked to submit and we submitted together with the Rights and Records by Design project and a bunch of other 
organizations that were also really concerned about um, these issues. And it, we got a very good reception. They were very interested. This is not an issue that had been raised before and, and there will be movement on it. Um, we have also been presenting this in, to other um, agencies. Uh, the, the South Australian state archives um, are actually looking to rewrite their laws to, to take these um, issues into account. So we have, we've got a little bit of traction now. Um, and so this is where we are. Um, and we'll be moving forward from. So I'm going, just going to stop there because I know it's been very long. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions that people might have.